I call it the level one conversation. So I kind of break it up into three separate conversations. And, and, and these lead you to different conclusions, right? Each one, they build on each other. And you can't really have conversation two unless you've had conversation one. And that first one is, you know, the level one conversation is this idea of, that leads you to the conclusion that th there is a God. And, and it, you ask questions like, who am I? Like, what am I? What is the purpose of all of this? What, like, why is the universe here at all? Why is it organized the way that, that it is? Like, why, why do there seem to be regularities and patterns? Like, and, and these are kind of deep, profound philosophical questions that if you go back to Plato and Aristotle and all the way back through Western history, like this conversation has been going on. And frankly, it's fascinating to see the way people have, have grappled with this. And I believe that if you, if you look into that, at least I did, I come to the conclusion having that conversation that there is something to this. There's oh, yeah. some like like the world is not just a you know a bunch of matter in motion and and that leads you to sort of this at least opening the door to the idea of some sort of a higher power right oh yeah there's and, so many things like when the the Fibonacci sequence was you know discovered by mathematicians it's like it's something so beautifully eloquent that there's it it just it transcends the logic of a, a chaotic system that just you know there's there's it seems impossible that this kind of complexity could just spring up out of nothing. And it does Absolutely. That definitely beg the question of and, how did and, this happen? How did all this come about? And people like, um, like I, I, I really enjoyed a guy named William Dembski who talks about this idea of specified complexity. It's basically the, the idea is it's not just that things are complex. It's that they, they, you have two independent patterns that match up. So I'll just give this real quick as an interesting example that I found really fascinating as I was going through this sort of process of understanding, like, is it, is there any reason to believe in God? Well, you have, it, one thing we want to know is how can you even detect if intelligence exists, right? Like one way that you can do it is, so, so some people have said, well, I would believe in God if God came and wrote like, hi, I'm God in the clouds or something. It'd be like, yeah. oh, that'd, that'd be nice. Because, but the thing is, is, is William Dembski actually breaks this down really interesting. He said, here's why that would make you think that there was an intelligence behind it. Because what you're looking at is you're looking at a pattern, like clouds make patterns all the time. And sometimes the, the probability of getting two clouds that are exactly alike is almost nothing. Like they, they, they vary in all sorts of subtle ways that they might be quote unquote complex. But what he points out is what's called specified complexity. And otherwise it's a pattern of, in this case, clouds, which have a particular kind of normal distribution of patterns of the way that they are that conforms to an independent pattern, right? So in this case, English language, it says, hi, I'm God, right? Yes. And we would initially, in we, we know, like when you see that, you go, an intelligence myth. This is the same reason that when you, an archaeologist does this. An archaeologist, when they're looking at some rock, they know the normal patterns that rocks have and rocks are very complex. You will never find two rocks that are the same. You can say they have all these molecules, all that kind of stuff. But when you find a pattern of rocks that conform to the pattern of a human form, you would say this is some sort of a statue. Yes. Right. Because you have the pattern of the human form then aligning with the pattern of a rock. And they're combining in this really unique way and you have what's called specified complexity. So my thing is I was studying all this stuff and reading William Dembski is, like, and they point out is that our universe is rife with specified complexity and the explanations for the, where that specified complexity comes from, such as in the sequences of the DNA code, which they will, they have a, an, an explanation for how that came about. Although there's, there's plenty to argue about that very long other topic. But the thing is, is that there exists specified complexity in the universe. And that is based on what we know, the only known cause of high levels of specified complexity is some sort of an intelligence. And so the theory of something being intelligently designed and people allow oh, it's a pseudoscience, all that, but they never deal with the actual arguments and the arguments yeah. from people like William Dembski, from people like um, Stephen Meyer, if you actually listen to those guys' arguments, they're very compelling. You guys use a, de a design uh, inference um, all the time. And let me show you an example. This, this license plate has specified complexity, okay? Or sorry, has complexity. This license plate here has specified complexity. Imagine on my birthday, 
I'm given a car, okay? My wife buys me a car. Maybe it's an old uh, Galaxy, 60 whatever. And uh, Ford Galaxy. And it says, uh, the license plate says T-I-M, my name's Tim, and the year I was born, 1983, okay? Now, I could say, well, you know, someone had to get that license plate, and it's just lucky I did. Because it turns out the, the actual complexity the probability of getting these two license plates is actually the same. You can calculate the probability, and it's about uh, 1 in 167 million. Okay? Same probability. But here's the difference between complexity and specified complexity. Specified complexity fits an independently given pattern. So it would be ludicrous for me to say, well, all license plates are equally complex to get, and it just so happens I got this one by chance. No, I'd be crazy to say that. It's because it fits this pattern, okay? And so there's a difference between these two. What about fine tuning? Here, Professor Wolpert says, well, it's just chance, it's just dumb luck. Again, I don't think that will work because it's not just the probability or the improbability issue here, it's the probability of having a life-permitting universe. To give an analogy, Suppose Bob is given a car for his birthday, and the license plate has on it CHT4271. Now, there are millions of license plate numbers, and that number is highly improbable, yet it would occasion no special interest. But suppose Bob was born on August 8, 1949, and he finds on his birthday car the license plate BOB8849. He would be obtuse if he just shrugged this off and said, oh well, nothing to be explained about that. Any number is equally improbable and there had to be some number on the car. But what makes this case different than the other? It is the combination of high improbability with an independently given pattern that results in what uh, design theorists call specified complexity. And it is that that tips us off to the fact that this is not due to chance, it is due to design. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant. A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be life prohibiting. Or, another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. 
The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life-permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life-prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life-permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence to suggest that fine-tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine-tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So, in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach, known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine-tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be, it was designed that way. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggest that a superintellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Will ye say, show unto me a sign, when ye have the testimony of all these thy brethren, and also all the holy prophets? The scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets, which move in their regular form, do witness that there is a supreme creator. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want more content, including the podcast, go to thoughtful-faith.com. Thanks for watching.